My name is Carl Klein. I teach at Onondaga Community College. I teach in the Computer Studies Department. And I live here in Cortland County, not too far from Onondaga. And we're here in Solon, New York, taking a tour around what I laughingly call our doomstead. This is our photovoltaic solar array that powers almost all of our electricity needs here at the doomstead. It's a total of 20 panels. Each panel is 200 watts if it's really working perfectly. So that means it's a total of 4,000 watts or 4 kilowatts. So it's, it's, it was about six years ago that we put this thing in. And in the six years since we put it in, we've only actually bought less than 5,000 kilowatts from National Grid since it's been in. So that's less than 100, 100, 100 kilowatts a month that we've actually had to pay for since we've had this system installed. And of course, it works far better in June during the solstice when the sun's up for 18 hours a day here in central New York. But this time of year, you can see the snow in the background. It's not quite so great this time of year. But still, in the course of a year, we do power almost all of our you know, electrical needs, including several freezers, HDTV, lots of computers. I said I was a computer studies professor. We have a lot of computers here, a lot of gadgets and gizmos. So we're, we're pretty close to actually being you know, independent here. We probably can't go off the grid yet, but if we probably had to, we probably could. Sure, the first thing you should do before going down down this route is the first thing you should do is have an energy audit. And right now in New York State, NYSERDA will give you either a free or super low cost um, energy audit where a professional will come in and do an analysis of your house, how much you use, how many things you have that need to be powered, and those sort of things. And they'll give you an estimate of what size system that you need. If you had a super efficient house, you might need a smaller system than we have right here. Or if you have more people, you might need a bigger system. So it would all depend. But then once they specify how big it has to be, then they will come out with the equipment and we chose to put ours on the ground because of taking snow off a lot easier. But if you have it on the roof, you know, you really can't do that, but most people can put them on the roofs and they work fine. There's almost no maintenance. The only thing I do is I come out here and shovel the snow off of it. So except for that, it's, it's maintenance free, unlike a wind turbine, which would have mechanical parts and those sort of things. So I really love this, this approach. So they come out and they put the pylons in the ground, they come out and they install it all, and it takes about maybe about a week or so to actually get all this part installed, and then, then you're good to go. And now the price of solar panels has pretty much collapsed from those days, so the equivalent system today might cost you out of your pocket probably less than $20,000, which is just about the price of a new car. Maybe a little bit less, depending on what kind of car you have to buy. And the way I view this whole system is, it's like buying a car and buying all the fuel at the same time. When you buy a car, you're pretty much committing to buying gasoline, but you don't pay for it up front. If you just change how you think about something like this, you're just paying for everything up front, including your fuel for your car, for about $20,000. And the lifetime of these panels, no one really knows how long they're going to last. They should last 50 years. So for an upfront investment of about $20,000, you could guarantee almost no electric bills for the next half of a century, which is a pretty good deal in my book. Well, welcome to our, our garden. This was our original garden we first set up when we moved here eight years ago, and we have since expanded it dramatically since that time. You'll see there's fencing around the outside. That's to keep out the giant four-legged locust, also known as white-tailed deer. So they're a problem here at the Doomstead. Uh, but here behind me, you'll see we've got some concrete block raised beds. And we use the raised bed method because it's just so cold um, in the spring and, and early fall that if we raise them up a little bit, the uh, ground stays a little bit warmer and stuff does tend to grow well. And we actually put compost inside the raised beds to help make them a little bit better soil-wise. So we, and we also have these uh, hoops behind us here. You'll see some of them have blown off and some of them are still covered. The hoops actually extend the season, extend the season about another month or so on each end because it traps heat inside there and it lets, lets things keep growing. We just picked the Brussels sprouts about two weeks ago. So they were hanging on until about then. So that was middle of November that we, they made it until. So we have hoops. It's just simple electrical conduit that you can buy at any home center. And we just bend them and make the hoops there that holds the uh, agricultural cloth on top. This is one of our newest additions to the Doomstead here. This is our little pond. And it's probably about between half and three quarters of an acre. And you can see it's still filling up. I think it's probably on total volume about one third filled right now. And most of the pond will be about eight feet deep, which isn't good enough for really cold water fish. 
like brook trout or something like that, but it should be good for warmer weather, warmer water fish. So we're going to actually have those in here, and I, I envision things like cattails and, and rushes growing along the edge to provide habitat for both the local animals and also for um, the water supply for our, our gardening efforts. So this is part of the ways to sort of increase our sustainability. The other thing I'm thinking about for this is we have a lot of early frost and late frost in the spring. So my thinking is by having nearly a million gallons of water stored here, when the sun hits it in the early spring and warms it up, it should provide a bit of a heat island for our other plants. So maybe we won't get hurt by those early frosts like we have been up till now. So that'll be an experiment to watch for in the future to see how that actually works out for us. But that's what we're thinking about. Our next stop here on the tour is down in the beginning part of the orchard. Uh, behind you, you've got some pear trees. There's a plum tree right here. There's some uh, nut bushes up there, a little blackberry bush up there. So we're trying to make use of more of the land than when originally was here when we first got here. So we've, we've made a lot of efforts at, at putting in some trees for some fruits and berry production. And this is roughly, as I, as I said, we're about 1,800 feet. So we're more like Adirondack climate here. So it's a little tougher than many parts of Onondaga. You've got a lot of apple orchards in Onondaga County, but they're a little bit warmer than it is right here for the most part. So anyway, we've got some orchard things set up here. And if you look off my left shoulder, you can just see there's a black gizmo over there. That's actually the trailer tongues when they brought the double wide in that we live in right now. So I've put them out in the field and I've got them, they're little triangles that are laid on the ground. And I've got them laid up like they are forward and back buttons on a web browser. So if you go onto Google Earth and look at our house, if you zoom in, you can actually see what looks like to be a browser forward and back button. And inside those little black gizmos, I've, we've planted strawberries. So it's our strawberry patch here at the Doomstead. Okay, right now we're inside the Doomstead here and we're in the living room and I've got a couple things to show you here. What we have right here is uh, the wood stove and we like heating with wood because it's a naturally renewable resource that grows right here in central New York. And we, I don't cut our wood supply here at the dunes that we don't have that many trees yet. So we buy our wood from our, one of our neighbors and the money we pay to him stays right here in New York. It doesn't go to fund some shake or somebody that doesn't like us somewhere else in the world. So we like heating the house with this. And we've got a big pot here. Right now there's nothing in it, but we like to keep a pot of soup on the stove too sometimes sir, for these cold winter days. Behind here there's the eco fan that's, it's actually a Stirling engine, which is, means it's powered by heat. There's no batteries, no electricity. It just generates its own electricity from the heat from the wood stove, and you can see it's spinning around there. Here in the front, we've got what is called the Best Drying Rack. It's, it's from a place called bestdryingrack.com, and it has <coughs> a little device here, a little wooden dowel that comes out that you can set by the wood stove in the wintertime, and then when you have your laundry, you can hang your laundry right here by the wood stove and not burn any kind of electricity or fossil fuel to dry your clothes. So it's basically free drying. I, I like that a lot. And we also have a, the, what we use to wash our clothes is a, is a front loading washer, which is more efficient than most people's top loaders. So we have things caught and covered on that ground too. So we have a high efficiency washer and then we can dry our clothes right here by the wood stove with locally produced um, fuel from our neighbor um, just over the hill. So here we are downstairs in the basement of the Doomstead right now. I've got a couple things to show you here too. We have right behind me here is our solar thermal system. And I really, really like, this is our newest addition here to our, to our house utilities. Uh, you may have seen the, the shot on the roof of the solar thermal collectors up there where they actually collect the sun's rays. And it actually has pipes that are filled with antifreeze. And this is the, this is the line from the roof right here. And if I'm feeling it right now, it feels pretty warm. And if I look at my gauge, the temperature on the roof right now is 101, almost 102 degrees. So even though it's 40 degrees outside right now, inside those collectors it's over 100 degrees. So we're capturing the sun's heat that way. And it's coming down through this pump. It gets routed through with some valves inside this giant tank right here. And inside this giant tank is a, is a, is a spiral of, of copper tubing, I suspect. I haven't actually seen it because it's inside the tank. But that takes the heat from the roof and puts it inside this giant tank of water and it then sends the cooler water back up to the roof to be heated again. And then, so this is our storage for our hot water system for our house, for our showers and dishwashing and things like that. And then 
that's our normal system, but in case the sun's not out or it's just too snowy or there's snow blocking the tubes, we also have a backup system that's more, far more efficient than most people's regular hot water heater over here, right next to it here is this um, gizmo right here. This is called a, an on-demand hot water heater, and this takes the water that's heated to some level already, and then if it's not quite hot enough, it will come on. It's powered by propane, and it will heat the water up to the temperature you need for your dish washing and, and showers and things like that. Next to our, our on-demand hot water heater, we have these giant expansion tanks that take the water from our well and store it here in the basement. Number one, it helps warm it up just a bit from the groundwater temperature, so when it does go to our water heaters, they don't have to work so hard, so we save a little bit of money and energy there. But we also have an, a really nice, because there's so much of it, it has time to actually warm up to the ambient temperature in the basement, so it's, it's far better that way. And then, moving along a little further to our left, is this is the heart of our solar our solar photovoltaic system that makes our electricity. Down below here, you can see inside this box, there are some giant, they look like giant car batteries. They actually store energy, so if the grid would go down, this is what powers our system here and keeps us, it keeps the internet working, it keeps the TV on, it keeps the lights on. That's the battery system down there. Here, there's a bunch of other gizmos that are associated with that system. Got a couple of meters. Here's the grid tie interface. This device is really important for National Grid. You don't actually have to have this from my perspective, but from the perspective of a line worker, if the grid does go down and the National Grid workers show up, this senses that the grid is down and doesn't let us feed system feed electricity back into the grid, potentially injuring one of the workers out there. So this senses the grid, the grid uh, current, whether it's there or not. Here's some connection boxes. So the main thing is found up here. This is the inverter. This is what takes the DC that the solar panels generate and convert it into AC current that the house runs on. So this right now is generating, it's saying minus 18 amps. So that means that's really good because that means we're sending power out to the rest of Solon right now. And if you look at these meters right here, these have little mechanical dials on them. This meter on the right is the one that shows what we're using right now for electricity. So it always spins this way no matter what. So if, we're, if something's on in the house, this meter is spinning. This is the one that I really like a lot because this one spins both ways. So when right now when we're making extra electricity, this one is spinning this way, which makes the cockles of my heart just swell and warm because that means I'm making money right now. So right now it's spinning at a pretty good clip in this direction which says, yes, we're sending out power. And so far, if I look back here on these charge controllers, these help match up the photovoltaic panels with the rest of the system. And we have two of them right now. And if I look, press the button, the one system is generating over 1,000 watts right now, and the other one's generating 1,500 watts. So right at this moment, we're making about two and a half kilowatts kilowatts, which is far less than we're using in the house right now in the daytime here on a, on a cold winter day. So right now, so far today, we've made a total of 15 kilowatts off a of system. So tonight when the sun goes down, we'll eat into some of that surplus, but for the day, probably for today, we'll be ahead for a little bit. So this is really a good day here at the Doomstead. I'm we're doing great today. Now we're here inside the Doomstead Root Cellar, which is our newest addition from the uh, it actually was built a couple of years ago, but we just finished it this year because we have added this special little um, heat exchanging system here, which I'll explain to you. Let me slide these potatoes back on the rack. Here you can see uh, some PVC pipe here behind me. And I really like to work in PVC because it's so forgiving. If you don't know what PVC is, it's this plastic pipe. Here's a big piece right here. And it's really light compared to iron. I can never work in that. But here in the root cellar, we've got a pipe coming down from the ceiling. This goes outside. And here, uh, right now, it's about 40 degrees outside today. It's bringing in cold air through natural convection down to the floor. And then as the, as the room heats up that colder air, it exhausts back out this pipe right here. So we've got a natural convection system with no electricity, no batteries needed, that brings in cold air for the wintertime and then exits back out. And we have this room is super insulated around the roof and the sides. 
So even though it's in the basement, it's still colder than the rest of the house on purpose. Okay, here we are in the Doomstead Zoo, which most of the critters are living right here, and there's actually are tens of thousands of them. The critters I'm talking about are our little worms. And they're our family pets, and they're great pets because they're very quiet, they eat what we don't want to eat, and they make great stuff that goes out in the garden. So if I look inside this worm bin here, this is actually a commercial worm bin that I bought, and it's called the Worm Factory. And this, this thing came with about five more of these little trays for about a hundred bucks. So for a hundred bucks, you, can be in the, you too can be in the worm business. So if I look inside here, and pull the cover back. I can look inside and you can see there are a bunch of worms in here and the worms really really like things like coffee grounds which I don't eat and they love eggshells. So we have growing here at the Doomstead in our basement year-round thousands and thousands of worms that give us products that we can't afford to buy elsewhere. And it's just taking old things like here's a old apple we didn't eat, they're working on that. Uh, just the garbage that comes out of the kitchen all winter long we bring out here and put into the worm bin. Great pets. So I'll, I'll put this lover cover back on and you can see here's the tray. Once this tray gets filled I'll just take this off, put this in here, and add more coffee grounds and more worm material bedding and things like that and then the worms will migrate up through the holes right up to the next level and I've got four or five more of these trays I can pile up here and by springtime I'll have you know probably 50 pounds or so of great worm castings to go out there and, and enrich the garden and for the house plants. Very cool system, very easy to use, very quiet, no energy, no batteries, no electricity. Well thank you so much for joining me today on our tour here of the Doomstead. I hope you found it interesting and that you, you maybe have some ideas about what you might be able to do at your house or your dorm room or, or with your family. I think if we all work together for the future, we can create a better world for ourselves, our kids, and those that come after us. As, as, they, as they say in the Native American world, you know, we need to think seven generations ahead. If we start doing that and living our lives like that, I believe we can have a much better future. Not a dark future, but a more positive future where we all have enough and have a rich, rewarding life.